Funding for the Hinckley Report is made possible in part by the Cleone Peterson Eccles Endowment Fund. Tonight on the Hinckley Report, new polling reveals which voters will determine who wins the upcoming elections. Candidates square off in debates as Utahns prepare to cast their ballots. And our panel examines which races are flying under the radar but could have major consequences for Utahns. Good evening, and welcome to the Hinckley Report. I'm Morgan Lyon Cotty, Associate Director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Jason is off this week. Covering the week, we have Carrie Bringhurst, co-manager of Utah Public Radio, Robert Gerke, political columnist with the Salt Lake Tribune, and Amy Donaldson, executive producer of KSL Podcasts. This has been a really interesting week. It seemed like we sort of had a slow buildup towards the political season, but we're truly in sort of the election madness that is usually October. Uh, so Robert, let's start with you. We have seen some new polling coming out of uh, a few different entities, including the Hinckley Institute and the Deseret News this week, uh, about the U.S. Senate race. What has been your big takeaway? Because we're seeing it still pretty tight. Yeah, it's tight. It, uh, I think between the last poll that Hinckley did and the most recent one, we saw a lot of undecided people get off the fence, but there's still about 12% that are, are undecided, and, and those are the people that these candidates are really vying for right now. Uh, I think the margins are make it basically a toss-up at this point, um, and, and if anything, the, the momentum seems to be swinging a little bit toward McMullen. Now, there's two schools of thought. If you're undecided at this point, you know who the incumbent is, and you haven't bought in on that yet. The other school of thought, and, and so you're more likely to break to the challenger. The other school of thought is that this is a Republican state. These people are generally voting Republican, and they're going to come home at the end. So one of those two narratives is going to play out, and it's going to ultimately determine who wins this race, I think. Yeah, and Amy, that come home language, we heard that in 2016 with then vice presidential candidate Mike Pence telling people, hey, remember where your home base is. Yeah. Does that call still hold sway now? What will it take for some of these undecideds to get off that fence? Uh, I think election, th getting the ballot in the mail, right? Yeah. I think they're undecided because they don't love the options that they have, um, but I think they'll probably vote party line. I, I think, I, I, I'm surprised it's as close it, as it is, and I'm also surprised at the, in the most recent polling, um, the number of uh, voters, or, or, you know, likely voters who disapprove of Evan McMullen. I was surprised by that because usually you see high approval numbers and high don't know numbers with a candidate that's not already in office. I expected Mike Lee's don't like numbers to be higher because he's in office and making decisions that people will, you know, have issues with. So I thought that was an interesting, um, development, and I wonder if advertising has something to do with it. Yeah, and Carrie, I want to get your read on something that Mike Lee said this week, actually, on Tucker Carlson, because we're hearing more endorsements and also non-endorsements coming in. And Senator Lee went on Tucker Carlson and talked about how he still has not received an endorsement from Mitt Romney. And what he said was, it's not too late, Mitt. You can join the party. I'd welcome you to do so, because otherwise you'd be stuck with two more years of Chuck Schumer being the leader and two more of Joe Biden having unfettered rule over the United States Senate without any Republican backstop. Who is this type of language? What voters was he trying to reach out to there? Yeah, um, that, that is the question. Why, why go on this show? Who are you trying to encourage? Um, wondering if this is kind of a prep for if things don't go the way that Mike Lee wants them to go. Um, is there maybe looking for somebody to blame? I don't know. Um, and also, who, who are the constituency that he's trying to reach out? I, I think a lot will be um, realized when we hear the debate between McMullen and Lee, because I do think, as we've talked about, why we're seeing maybe um, an undecided. Yeah. Is it really a vote that we're seeing in the polls against Lee, or is it really a vote um, for McMullen? Um, I'm hearing that people don't really know what McMullen is all about. 
Well, and what's interesting also about these don't knows, and Amy, you were just talking about the people that are still saying they don't know. A lot of those are in the middle of the political spectrum. The, there are the moderates, maybe people that lean a little bit one way or the other. And you were saying you think people will vote party line. Um, but usually in these campaigns, candidates are trying to figure out where, what is the tent of voters that I need. And here we're, sure. we're not often talking about those moderates in Utah. Yeah, I think because I think we don't have a true like large group of independents like that are truly unaffiliated mm. you have independents who don't vote party line and that's considered independent in this state um, but by and large they generally feel more affection for one party or the other and that's where I think you're gonna see the swaying happen and that's where I think there could be some answers that come at during the debate that will help people who maybe lean uh, would have voted for a Democratic candidate who lean Democratic, who will vote, who will back Evan. They don't like Mike as a candidate, so they, they may yeah. they may choose that. Well, I think that's why it's the, the Romney dynamic is so interesting, too, because if Mike Lee is trying to expand his base, he, he, we know Mike Lee has his Republican hardcore base. And let's be honest, that's who he's speaking to and on the, Tucker Carlson. And that's who he's right, speaking yeah. to on Tucker Carlson. If he's trying to expand it, a Mitt Romney endorsement might really help him do that. But he keeps highlighting the fact that Mitt Romney has not endorsed him. And I, I just don't understand the logic behind that. Because, you know, he released this this thing that said 48 Republican senators endorsed me. Well, Utahns don't really care about Senator Ossoff or Hawley endorsing him. They care about why Mitt Romney has hasn't done it yet. And to keep drawing attention to it, I think, just drives, po drives home the point in these undecided voters that that's that, that Mitt, for some whatever reason, Mitt didn't do it, yeah. has not endorsed. But don't you think it's a loyalty thing? Like, it's a, you know, we're from the same party. Like, we're on the same team, right? We want our team yeah. to win. Even if you don't like me, go to bat for me, have my back, right? But, but did Lee endorse no. Romney? <laughs> no, he did not. But I, I think that's what's at play here, mm -hmm. is like, we're on the same team. We care about Republican values. You need to back me so that we can get those things done. Well, and there are some interesting points about the fundraising is that we are seeing a pretty astronomical amount of money coming into this race. Currently, from just outside spending from PACs uh, in this race, we're at $7 million. And these are largely on some of these advertisements that are flooding into onto people's mm -hmm. Facebook feeds and onto their, um, their screens at home when they're trying to watch anything. Robert, how does this change the dynamic of the race? Well, it, it changes it in a couple ways. I think, first and foremost, the, the candidates don't necessarily control their message when you see all of this outside money coming in. And we've seen some really brutal attack ads being run against Evan McMullen by Club for Growth. McMullen's campaign has sued Club for Growth over one of them. Um, and and the candidates kind of lose control of their message, but it also gives the candidates some cover. They don't have to do the dirty work themselves. Um, and I think we're going to just see more of it. Uh, Senator Rand Paul's PAC recently put a buy-in in this market. Um, you know, Club for Growth says they're going to keep spending hundreds of thousands of dollars up until Election Day. One thing that we, I think we can take from that, though, is that it shows that this race is a lot closer than the Lee people are, put, are, are leading us to believe. Uh, they say their internal polling has him up by 18 points. Well, he's not acting like an 18 point you know, favorite at this point by going on Tucker Carlson, begging for this Romney endorsement, running these ads, running really hard hitting ads that have a high backfire potential. And so I think I think we can take away from that that this race is a lot closer than they're letting on. Than they, than, than they would lead us to believe. Yeah, and to that point, uh, it's interesting that in 2016, there was $350,000 from outside PAC, and now we're at $7 million, um, just Well, the race wasn't close. I mean, when the race is contested, you know, you have to, yeah. the outside, it becomes, and the Senate is a 50-50 Senate. That's right. You know, yeah. every seat is critical. And Car how that will impact uh, the overall um, Senate leadership within, you know, the Senate yeah. is, is something that also needs to be taken into consideration. That's a big player in all of this. Yeah. It's happening nationally, not just here in Utah. Carrie, this outside PAC money, this outside messaging, how does how do voters react? How do, how do they recognize the difference between the campaigns and the PACs as they're absorbing all this information? I don't know that they understand the difference between the campaigns and the PACs, but they do listen to the messaging. And it does have an impact. And again, that's why I think the debate between these two Senate candidates will be critical. It will give McMullen an opportunity to explain maybe some issues that have been misrepresented. But we also have to remember that McMullen is also getting money from PACs, mm -hmm. and it goes both ways. I, 
I think it is confusing for the voter to try and determine the differences. Well, and when you talk about that center voter, they're the ones who are turned off by your most negative advertising. So your base is okay with the attack ads if, if it means holding on to the seat. Yeah, and this is an interesting thing. We've been talking about the Dignity Index a little bit here mm -hmm. in Utah. This is a new project um, from an organization called Unite, Tim Schreiber's organization that's partnering with the University of Utah. And this is the pilot project in, here in our state where we've uh, trained all of these politically diverse students to basically rate political speech on these dignity index, trying to suss out how civil people are being. Uh, and what is interesting is this week the students are looking at these third party entities, looking at these advertisements from PACs. Uh, Carrie, we'll get to the debate you moderated in a moment, but I know you're really familiar with the political speech, but our candidates have been saying, how do you think it's going to compare to what these PACs are putting out? Um, I think the jury's still out on that because it is kind of a new way of measuring things. But uh, listening to KSL recently and reviewing some of the debates and uh, this particular aspect, I think it's a great learning opportunity. I think it's, it's wonderful that these students are, are thinking about this and if there's dignity within our conversations in the political races. I do think there will be some impact. Um, from what I'm hearing people say, uh, just in the congressional debates, they are looking at how people are, how the candidates are treating one another. And I, I do think it will become something that will have an impact, maybe not so much now, but in the future, if, if this type of measurement continues. Yeah. Before we move on from the Senate race, we do have to mention that there was another high profile endorsement, and that is um, everyone's favorite Luke Skywalker endorsed McMullen apparently on Twitter this week. Mm -hmm. Do these have any, I mean, we see these in presidential races and other things. We are not used to seeing them in Utah for our federal or local races. Do, is this just sort of like a blip for people? Does it have, Robert, does it have any impact? <laughs> I mean, I don't know that it's necessarily going to change a lot of people's mind. Uh, it does get him some publicity, some yeah. attention. Uh, he was in positive town. Positive publicity. It was positive yeah, publicity. Uh, he, you know, he's, it, and it sort of, they, the campaign used it just used uh, bolster their vo volunteer turnout, and so in that respect, it can do that. It, it also he has a big uh, platform, and so he can solicit donations nationwide in a way that most campaigns uh, that are run at the state level can't do it. So you know, is it a game changer? Not necessarily, but you always want to have a Jedi on your side, I guess, when push <laughs> comes to shove. That's great. Uh, that'll be your quote for the whole <laughs> week. That's what people will remember. Robert said during the Hinkley report, um, and again. You've all mentioned the debate happening Monday evening, and people can watch it right here on PBS. Uh, so, Carrie, I want to come back to you. You moderated the debate for the first congressional candidates uh, at Weber State earlier in the week. What was your big takeaway? What were they focusing on? There was a lot of conversation about inflation yeah. and who's to blame for inflation. Um, even a little note of disdain toward the media as having an impact in what um, Rick Jones considers to be not as big a problem as maybe the rest of us might say it is. That's something he says has happened through past presidencies and is not unusual. Um, of course, you know, Congressman Moore, the incumbent in the race, um, very much feeling like this is part of the Biden administration and that federal spending is out of control. So uh, to me, that was the, the gist of the conversation was related to the inflation and the cost of housing. Something that is really being felt, I think, throughout the state again are the, the gas prices, and, and we talked a little bit about that. But um, I learned a lot during the debate. I was reminded about the fact that the three higher, the largest higher institutions of education are now in that district, mm -hmm. the University of Utah, Utah State, and Weber State. So I think if I were to um, be able, if I would have had more time, I would have wanted to talk a little bit more about higher education and what uh, Congress can do with states to help support and make it possible for students, again, to afford to go to school. Yeah, that's interesting. And that was one of the student questions, right. talking about affordability. Um, and there are a lot of students and young people in that district. Uh, Amy, these are still, this is still, Blake Moore is relatively new congressman. Rick Jones mm -hmm. is 
pretty unknown. Mm -hmm. What did voters learn? Anything new um, that could change no, I think the race? No, so. I think their explanations, I think people are concerned about whether you like it or not, inflation is an mm -hmm. issue, and whether or not you believe it's complicated by the pandemic or the results of tax cuts versus what the feds are spending um, and the bailout. I mean, it's probably a lot of combination of things. So I think they, they learned a little bit more. I thought both of them performed pretty well in that, and, and same as in CD3, I thought, um, they answered the questions, they gave information, they told you how they felt, and so you could gauge where you are in relation to their, um, to, to their uh, political ideologies. Yeah. I think voters also learned who Rick Jones is. Yeah, because uh, when you're running, in one of the, running against an incumbent as a Democrat in Utah, it's really hard to get a lot of attention and get your name out there. And, and that's where some of these challengers are, are still trying to break through. So I think yeah. if nothing else, he got, a, he got a platform for an yeah. evening. Yeah, there's been a few of those uh, people coming onto the scene that I, I don't know that they'll win any elections, but I hope they stay active in politics. They have some good ideas and some involved people. Yeah, and the dignity index on that one was it was pretty was high. high. Yeah. There yeah. were the, yeah, that was interesting, and we we really saw that also with that CD three debate. And mm -hmm. um, there are arguments that it's easier to stay a little more dignified when it's not a close election. Uh, I'll let we have to let the voters decide on that. But it is interesting. These first those first two debates were relatively civil. Um, the new really newsworthy debate. We should say they're all newsworthy. But the one that has taken up the most ink. This week is the fourth congressional debate, uh, which occurred at PBS Utah, uh, at the University of Utah, on Wednesday. Um, and just a few hours before the debate, Congressman Burgess Owens released a video saying that he would not be attending. Um, and this tied back to the fact that the moderator was the executive editor of the Salt Lake Tribune, um, and back to uh, what Congressman Owens called a racist uh, political cartoon based on some comments he'd made in Texas at a visit to the southern border. Uh, so, Robert, I have to start with you, because you're a representative from the Salt Lake yeah. Tribune. What has been the reaction to Congressman Owens? Owens not showing up to this debate. Well, uh, I, I think a lot of people maybe were surprised by it. I frankly wasn't. We know he didn't debate in the primary. Uh, he was claiming then that it was a partisan uh, bias against him, and so he wouldn't c participate in the Utah Debate Com Commission's primary debates. And. It, you know, the, the Republican Party tried to stage a debate for him with a Republican moderator against a Republican candidate, and he wouldn't participate in that either. So I didn't expect him to participate in this debate at any point. Um, I think, my personal feeling is, it shows what he thinks of voters. He doesn't really care if they get a chance to hear, you know, why he thinks what he does or, you know, defend his record. Um, you know, it shows a level of contempt, I think, for, for the electorate. and I frankly feel like if you're a representative that part of that title is to represent and that means showing up and answering questions for, to your constituents and I think it's a real shame he didn't do it. I think that's what happens when you have a lopsided race that they feel less accountability to voters and they feel less accountability to the media they can do these kinds of things and there's not a consequence because the natural consequence is that you would lose the election if you didn't keep in he hasn't debated in over two years so I think the fact that you know and I don't know how I, I live in CD4 and I I have never been invited to a town hall or any kind of interact, and I've been invited to those um, with uh, Evan McMullen, and so I know they are happening. Um, but yeah, I think that if it's if there's not if it's not a close race, if there isn't some competition there, you can get away with not being accountable. And if I could just piggyback on that a little bit, I think what one of the things we're seeing in these congressional races is the, the, the impact, the fallout from the gerrymandering that took place earlier in the year, because we ha whereas we used to have the fourth district that would kind of seesaw back and forth, you know, Jim Matheson, Mia Love, Ben McAdams, Burgess Owens, now it's a 30-point Republican edge in that district. Mm -hmm. and, and, and as Amy said, there's no reason for Burgess Owens to show up if that's the case, because there's no way he's going to lose. He does, it doesn't matter what he does. At this point, he go, he went out to Georgia and campaigned for Herschel Walker rather than campaigning here in Utah and participating in a debate. Yeah, we should say that there was still a debate last night: mm -hmm. Democrat Darlene McDonald and United Utah candidate January Walker. Uh, and actually, a pretty there were some pretty pointed uh, moments in the debate where they really highlighted the differences between their policies and Congressman Owens. Carrie, what really stood out to you? How did they? 
set them apart or what are voters looking for when we have this type of debate? Well, I, I think the fact that they um, had the courage to show up was, was something. Um, you know, debating whether there should be a debate or not, I don't know if, you know, as, as somebody that's been involved in that process, I, I think we're fortunate to have a commission that will set something up. And so the fact that they came and shared their opinions, um, and there were some, some very strong words said about the no-show, but it, it did give those candidates, and I, I learned a lot. It gave them an opportunity to share their ideas, and if nothing else, uh, may in the, the future eventually lead to conversations about why it's important to be part of the process. I know as a voter, I took it personally that I could not hear from all of the candidates, and, and, I, I, and I think those that are running against the incumbent also expressed that that frustration yeah. that these conversations need to happen interesting um, Amy you were just talking about the redistricting mm -hmm. is is that the only reason that we're seeing that this is not as competitive as it used to be because before the redistricting this mm -hmm. was considered what they call an R plus 13 you have that 13 point advantage for sure. a Republican yeah. and now it's it's just three points higher it's R plus 16 yeah is that did that make that much of a difference um, I mean I think so I because I think I think, I mean, I look at what Mia Love did in Congress and then how voters held her accountable, and I look at what Burgess Owens has done in Congress and how he has has or has not been held accountable, and I, I can, that's the only thing I can account for. It's the difference in the voters. Some voters I've talked to don't know they're in CD4 um, since the change. So, um, and me, you look at, I think it's Holiday uh, that's divided up four ways, right? You have an, an intersection there where, yeah. you know, one, one mayor represents four districts. And I just, when we talk about community and dignity and looking at other factors besides political or partisanship, um, I wonder if that is really the world we want to live in, or if we really want our leaders to be accountable to us, maybe we ought to live in the, you know, like have the district be the people who live there and local leaders can hold the congressional leaders accountable. Um, I think that's where you get some of the best policy interactions. And not to, not to diminish Darlene McDonald, but yeah. in each of the previous elections, we've also had uh, an incumbent Democrat with Jim Matheson or Ben McAdams who have made that race competitive. It's really hard uh, as a Democrat to win in this in this Somebody state. with name recognition. But, yeah. Ben but, had been the Salt Lake County mayor. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I think you had someone who had Darling was well known in political circles, but I don't know that she's well known outside of that. So you're yeah. right about that. Is, is that what it takes moving forward? And we should also mention the race between Mia Love and Doug Owens, who also comes from a large, well known Democratic yeah. family. Is that mm -hmm. what it would take for Democrats to be more competitive? I think it takes the ability. Well, in that district, you're just not going to be competitive. And 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 I can say, I think that you know, I know. Congressman McAdams, former Congressman McAdams, was looking at running in this in in the, up in this election, but after he saw the redistricting, there was just no way he was going to be able to do it because no Democrat can win in any of those four districts. It's it's almost impossible. So, what it's going to take is better districts, and that might include the lawsuit that's pending now. Uh, and it's going to take a, a well-known, well-funded Democrat who can who can win. The alternative is the Seven McMullen path we're seeing, and and I think that might serve mm -hmm. as a model uh, going forward because it, you, you can win if, on, if you can put together that coalition. Mm. Uh, I don't, and I also think you're seeing an evolution in the, vote, in the voters. When you see younger voters coming in who don't necessarily hold their parents' and grandparents' political ideologies, that may be what shifts it. Right, so yeah. I think that's and, and people moving in from out of state or yeah, interesting. Yeah, Carrie. So what what role does the Utah Democratic Party play in all of this? And where is the party? What is happening with the party? Why aren't they able to encourage some of these more well-known um, political supporters? Well, that that's a million-dollar question. Like, how do you get people to run if the if they're really tilting at a windmill, right? So uh, you're going to spend a lot of your time, energy, and emotion investing in a race that everybody says you're going to lose, right? So that, that I think that is that's the difficult. Or like with ha Kale Weston was a great candidate. Why didn't somebody talk to him about running in a different race? 
and and then support this strategy. I don't know. I don't. I don't. I'm not involved in the Democratic Party, so I don't know. But I do think some of those longer-term strategies would be interesting. Yeah. To well, and one of the way places we're seeing Democrats really invest more funds and energy is in Salt Lake County, mm -hmm. uh, in some of these races. And we talk so much about the 50-50 Senate and the majority in the House. Uh, but one thing that surprises some people is that Republicans hold a majority on the Salt Lake County Council, and we have some pretty competitive races mm -hmm. there. I know Robert, you focused a lot about this yeah. recently in your research and your writing, and you're really looking at the council race between Democrat Suzanne Harrison and Republican Richard Snellgrove. What should voters and even people outside of Salt Lake County be paying attention to? Well, I think one of the things that makes this race important is you, we, we saw Sheldon Stewart, a Republican, knock off a more moderate Republican. So that six to three majority could become even more conservative. Um, Suzanne is a, a state legislator whose district was basically dissolved during the most recent redistricting. Uh, Richard Snellgrove obviously has been in politics a long, long time, uh, but these these countywide races, I think, are sort of the easy, the best opportunity for Democrats to make some inroads. Uh, Shireen Gorbani was upset last time, and that was kind of uh, a, a, an upset. I, people, I think, expected her to win. But there there is an opportunity for Democrats to shift this uh, county council a little bit, make it a little bit more even, make it a 5-4 council. Uh, and I think it's going to be a heck of a race. She's outraised him almost 10 to 1. Uh, she's got a reputation for being a very hard worker, and, and so I, I'm eager to see how this one plays out. Amy, in just our last 10 or 20 seconds, is this how Democrats maybe make inroads and sort of build that pipeline of name recognition? Absolutely. And I think if you look across the country at what Republicans did when Democrats took control of the national government, they went and they won state houses. That's how you make it that's how you make a difference. Thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. And thank you for watching the Hinckley Report. The show is also available as a podcast on PBSUtah.org slash Hinckley Report or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for being with us and we will see you next week.